Okay, good morning everyone. Um, so we're going to uh, finish uh, the membrane section in today's class and then on Wednesday's class we'll start in our next uh, major topic in this course. So today's class is, uh, is really uh, some theory and some calculations, just a final bit of theory and mostly calculations and problems to get us comfortable with the membrane area. Uh, we're looking specifically today at reverse osmosis and I said in last week's class it's so widely used. It's, it's pretty much incredible how many application areas of reverse osmosis there are out there. For some, for technology that's relatively new, um, it really only grew and matured in the late uh, 70s, early 80s, and now is so widely deployed in many industries that you'll almost certainly come across it at some point in your career. And I left you last class with, um, we were going through some slides from a presentation from, uh, from a European Union uh, conference and that presentation, uh, the reason why I went through that was just to give you an idea for the magnitude of these units, right? Just to get an idea of how big they are, the capacities for them and the costs of operating them. Those are important topics. This course isn't just about learning the theory behind the separation but also understanding the size of these units, right? Because one day you'll be in a position where you're probably purchasing these units or working with them and one thing you have to be clear of is how much space do they take up, right? So when we, we add new units to our plant, we need land, we need buildings to keep those units in and so we need to get an idea of a visual uh, scale. And so last class I showed some other photos. This is one that you've seen several times now in this course about uh, reverse osmosis and you can see the, the, the real parallelization going on there to treat that volume of water. So 21 million meters cubed of, of water is, is created from that every year. Now, what is interesting as well about this, uh, this operation here is this term, BOOT, B-O-O-T. Um, you may have picked up on it in the prior presentation as well. Uh, build, own, operate, transfer. This is, these units are so expensive um, to build that the only customers in many cases for the large-scale units are municipalities and governments. Okay? And municipalities and governments are not in the, in the business of running chemical plants. Uh, they're in a different line of work and that they do effectively. So what they typically will do is that they will commission the build of that unit, they will own it initially, and then operate and then transfer it. So, so when I say they, I mean the company that will build this, so GE or a large, uh, a large company that does this for bread and butter living, they will build the unit, they will own it for an initial period of time and charge rent to the municipality or charge an amount per meter cubed treated. They will operate it and once it's up and running and commissioned, they will then transfer the ownership to the municipality or the government. And that, so that minimizes risk on the government side or the municipality side of receiving a unit or a plant that they really don't know how to operate effectively. So they, this is a standard procedure you'll see, especially in the wastewater treatment um, business. Okay? And so for any, any business where your customer is typically a municipality or government, this seems to be the way that things are moving now. So let's, um, let's just continue on with that example. I, I started last class, we were looking specifically at costs. I was showing you typical values here for salt water or seawater uh, reverse osmosis, often abbreviated. Uh, so if you're looking for more information on this, you often come across that acronym, SWRO, seawater or salt water reverse osmosis. Um, and so that table there gives you an idea of costs and typical flows. We spoke about um, LMH in a prior class, liters per meter squared hour. Conversion is the number that tells you how much of your material coming in. So your feed gets split into two parts, the permeate. And so in this case, we call that the cut or the conversion. It says that if you're feeding 100%, 40% 40 goes to permeate, 60% gets wasted and returned to the water source. So uh, the body of seawater or salt water that you, you're taking that from. So those are some important numbers. If you, um, like I said, if you Google some of that stuff, you, just to confirm what typical fluxes are, I, here I was looking for SWRO LMH and then 
you can see here that typical flux values are recorded down here. 10 to 15 LMH, um, and this says the recently investigated operations of low LMH, and this result, uh, sorry, the concluded this range may result in lower overall life cycle cost for desalination, and then they talk about 14 to 20 LMH, so a higher flow. So that, that number there gives you, an, or those numbers give you an idea of the ranges of LMH we expect from these, these treatment processes. Um, Another article I found, um, this is an Israeli company that uh, published this article in a journal, and they're looking at LMHs over this range, for 8 to 40. In fact, I'll post this abstract on the course website or, or a link to it, and you, you should be able to read and understand that very technical abstract now, based on what you've learned so far in this class. Okay. So they also talk there about energy costs. 1.5, uh, 1.8 to 2.8 kilowatt hours to treat a meter cubed. So, so technical terms that we've become comfortable with. Let's um, finish up the section then with some final, some final theory, and perhaps let me just uh, work through the slide here on the board quickly. It's um, a good overview as well of what we've looked at over the past few weeks. So we've, al we've always used this equation that J is equal to the flux is driving force over resistance. Okay, and what you can see from this slide there is that we can, we'll use this term now coming up, permeance. Uh, in Sean's talk, he, he used that term. Permeance is often used as well. It's simply just one over resistance. Okay, so if you want to increase the flux, you want to increase the permeance. If you want to increase the flux, you want to decrease the resistance. They're both the same or equivalent statements. Um, and of course, permeance is equal to uh, permeability over unit uh, uh, over length. Okay, so what's the thickness of the membrane that we have to travel over? Um, so of course, here you can start to see that resistance is directly proportional to the length of the the path traveled by the fluid. And of course, that's one parameter we want to minimize. Now, length isn't something that's easy to measure, um, and it's not necessarily uniform throughout. And so what we'll typically resort to is to use permeance. Okay, so permeance is um, a more useful number. So if I rewrite that equation, I can write it as permeance times driving force. I'll just abbreviate to DF. Okay, so driving force is very easy to measure. That's your osmotic pressure difference. That's your delta P. We can use sensors. We can use lab instruments to calculate our driving force. Our flux is very easy to measure as well. It's the volume of permeate per meter squared per unit time. Very easy, easy quantities to measure. So from those two, we can then calculate permeance. Okay, so that's, um, that's how it's typically done, and the case studies we'll use today uh, will we'll use that idea. Let me just also, um, if, like while we're talking about reverse osmosis exclusively today, uh, perhaps just put the rest of the membrane topic in context of that equation, and perhaps point out something you, that wasn't obvious initially. So J is equal to flux. I said is driving force over resistance. Well, let's write those uh, out symbolically. Driving force here was delta P minus delta pi. And the resistance is due to two pieces, the me medium and the cake. Okay. So what you may notice then is that when we were looking at microfiltration, the very first topic, Essentially, it's that same equation, but what we assumed was that delta pi was zero. So if you write delta pi equals to zero and you write Rm is approximately zero, you'll get the microfiltration equation back that we used a few weeks ago. And ultrafiltration, similar deal. Ultrafiltration, if you write delta pi is, a pro is equal to zero, 
you get the ultrafiltration equation. And RO, well, in RO, we'll see, we assume that my cake resistance is essentially zero. Okay. So the same equation, a very flexible equation, and that's the reason for it is obvious. The flux equation I spent a lot of time indicating is a generic equation that applies to all areas of engineering, not just chemical, but all sorts of other engineering applications use the flux equation. And so what essentially these different filtrations, uh, sorry, these different membrane um, make varying assumptions and simplify that equation. So in RO, this is an absolutely valid assumption that there's no cake resistance. We pre-filter that. I showed you in the flow sheet last class substantial upstream flocculation and filtration steps so that we get essentially only a liquid with dissolved salts in it. So there's nothing solid in that liquid phase. So there is no cake to be formed. So RC is zero. Okay, so the only resistance essentially with, with reverse osmosis is due to the medium itself. It's got to be, right? Because if you think about what reverse osmosis is doing, we're essentially right there at that nanometer scale and we're trying to limit the flux of salt through the membrane and allow water, a smaller molecule, to pass through preferentially. So you're right down at that very small molecular scale. Um, and so the resistance of that is, is extremely high. Just an interesting point here about delta pi being zero for ultra and microfiltration. Um, just recall there that del what delta pi is. Um, delta pi <coughs> from the last class you'll recall is the concentration on the feed side minus the concentration on the permeate side times RT. Okay, so that was from last week's class. Well, remember in microfiltration and ultrafiltration we said nothing passes through that membrane. We made the assumption that the concentration on the permeate side was zero. Okay. So CP was zero in, when we were looking at that topic. So that simplifies the equation down to CF, the feed concentration times R times T. How can that possibly be zero? Yeah, we're not at deltas, right? How can, this, how can delta pi, when it simplifies down to that, be zero? R can't be zero, T is certainly not zero. It simply is an indication that the concentrations that we're dealing with, CF, right? CF was moles of ions per meter cubed. Those moles of ions per meter cubed in ultra and microfiltration are very, very small. So that, that assumption, if you go look back at the micro and ultrafiltration notes, you'll never see a delta pi term there in the numerator. Well, I was kind of lying to you. It's, it is there. It's just incredibly small that we can, we can safely neglect it. And you can prove that to yourself. Plug in the molar mass for typical molecules that are microfiltrated and ultrafiltrated, and you'll see that that number reduces relative to delta p that second term is essentially zero. And so I never even spoke of it back then. But it was there all along, uh, or should be there all along, if you're being uh, very picky about those things. OK, so that board over there on the right essentially gives you a global view of everything we've covered in the past few classes. Let's, um, let's go give uh, some examples and try to use this now. So the example uh, I'd like you to look at um, well, perhaps maybe before I do that, let me, um, let me just talk a little bit about this theory in the context of the next example. Just one more point to add here is that when we're looking at the flux, there really are two fluxes. There's the flux of the solvent, but there's also the flux of the solute. So the solvent flux is the easiest one. Um, we'll often call it JV, or to emphasize that it's on a volumetric basis, JV of the solvent is, flu is that flux, and it's the driving force over resistance. Well, another way to say that is driving force times permeance, and 
what we'll do then is re we'll give permeants a special symbol, A. A of solvent times the driving force delta P minus delta pi. Okay, so that's the only new piece of theory in today's class is that the permeance of the solvent will give a new symbol, A solve. Okay, so that's the only new piece over there. The second piece of theory uh, that we'll introduce is the solute flux. The solute flux or salt flux, which we'll indicate as J salt, is the flux of salt through the membrane. Okay? This is, again, new to us because prior to this topic, we assumed that nothing passes through the membrane other than the solvent itself. But we learned last class that, in fact, some solvent, uh, sorry, some salt or solute will pass through the membrane. Let's um, just get a visual diagram here that always helps. I'll redraw what I had last class. So there's my membrane. And this is my feed side. And this is my permeate side. And I said to you last time, we can consider the concentrations, if I plot the concentrations here on the vertical axis. So this vertical scale is sem essentially represents zero concentration. So this concentration on the feed side, we'll call it CF, or sometimes it's called C bulk as well, the bulk concentration. And it's essentially well mixed, and then we'll get the slight increase up to the wall. So that's C wall. And then that concentration profile drops off, and we get C permeate. Okay. So the permeate side has a concentration of salt. This is the C's will always have units of kilograms of salt per meter cubed. Okay, so it's a concentration, and so that permeate is a non-zero concentration on that side. So salt has a flux as well. Not only do we have the, f the liquid phase passing through the membrane, the salt as well has a flux through the membrane. And it should be very, very low, of course, if the membrane is doing its job. Well, how do we calculate the salt flux? Salt flux will have similar units. It will be the mass flow per unit area per unit time. Okay, so those are the units we're looking for. And when we're looking at the salt flux, we're going to write it in exactly the same way. There's a driving force and there's a resistance. And we will use the same idea as we did here before, where we will flip the resistance over into the numerator, and we will call that A salt. So there's my resistance captured in that number, and my driving force is the concentration difference. The concentration difference across the membrane is the wall concentration, Cw, minus the permeate concentration. And Again, here we're making a little bit of a simplification that's fairly reasonable, is that this concentration here on this side is a relatively a flat line. That concentration is a flat line. Okay, we can't ever go really measure right there at the wall to calculate the true concentration differences, um, but we can assume that this side is fairly well mixed, and this side here is fairly well mixed, and that's, that's a very reasonable assumption to be making. And so then in that case, we can rewrite that concentration difference as C feed minus C permeate. Okay. So that's my salt flux. And salt flux can also be written as the following. Just going to make a little bit of space here so we can write it on this side.
the salt flux is equal to the solvent flux times Cp. Okay. And we, can, we get that by a, a mass balance, right? So whatever salt passed through the membrane must show up here on the permeate side. Well, how much shows up on the permeate side is the concentration of the permeate in kilograms of salt per meter cubed times the solvent flux. So let's just do a unit balance here. This is, you're going to notice this in today's class that units are very important here. So the solvent flux is meters cubed of solvent per meter squared second multiplied by the concentration kilograms of salt per meter cubed solvent. Okay? And you get then the units of salt flux on that side. Kilograms of salt per meter squared second. My strong advice when you're dealing with uh, the membrane equations is always write your units specifying whether it's salt or solvent. Don't just write meters cubed per meter squared second. Or don't just write kilograms per meter squared second. Write kilograms of what? Is it kilograms of salt, kilograms of solvent? Because when you do unit cancellation, you obviously cannot cancel out kilograms of salt with kilograms of solvent, right? The, the units, even though it's kilograms and kilograms, must be consistent with the same mass that you're canceling out. You're going to see this uh, being important in the problems that come up. Okay, so that's the new theory, essentially all summarized on that slide. And if, in fact, the only stuff that's new on the slide is the stuff that's in orange. Everything else you already uh, know from before. So let's... Uh, Let's try this problem here. Here we're taking brackish water. It's another term for salt water is, that's often used in this literature. Brackish water, salt water, at 1.8 weight percent sodium chloride, 1,000 psi is fed to a spiral wound reverse osmosis membrane. We were given conditions on the permeate side. On the permeate side, we have a much lower concentration. So here on the feed side, I've got a concentration coming in of 1.8 weight percent. Okay, so notice here's our first problem. 1.8 weight percent, how do I convert that to kilograms of salt per meter cubed? Okay, we know that we need units of C in this form, but I've got them given in that form. On this uh, other side, we've got a permeate concentration of 0 0.05 weight percent. We're told pressure information as well, 68.5 on this side. And we're told 3.42 atmospheres on the permeate side. Okay. The only two things that are given to us other than that information are our two permeances. We're given the permeance of water, the solvent. And notice the awkward units over there. That's typical for permeants. And the permeance for salt. So that's a salt and a solvent. The 1.1 times 10 to the minus 2, 1.1 uh, times 10 to the minus 4 is the permeance of solvent. And the 16 times 10 to the minus 8 is the permeance of salt. Okay. From that information, I'd like you just to lay out your plan of approach to calculate the flux of the water. And you're asked to report that answer in LMH. Okay, so what's the flux of the solvent? This is usually the most interesting number for us. So go ahead and, and work on that for a minute. How will you plan to calculate the flux? Don't, you don't actually need a calculator just yet uh, to do this part. So work with someone next to you or on your own and we'll get some ideas from you.
no ideas, no discussions, <laughs> very quiet. <clears throat> so last year's final exam had a question very similar to this, this style. And if you're finished planning it, feel free to start plugging in some numbers and calculating away. Um, do some of those unit conversions that you need to do. Okay, so the, the goal, the first goal of the question, um, sorry, the first question's goal is fairly obvious. Calculate the flux of water um, in, in LMH. So we're heading to that. And the plan actually here is deceptively simple. We know that it's, it's that equation that will tell us the flux. And we're, in fact, given pretty much everything in the right hand side over there. We're told that A solvent is 1.1 times 10 to the minus 4. So we know this value. Do we have enough information for delta P? Yeah, we do. Do we have the information we need for delta pi? Yeah. Pretty much, yeah. Okay. So we're this should be should be straightforward and it and it actually is, other than for um, a small unit conversion there. So let's, uh, let's pay attention to that. Delta pi is probably the one that needs a little bit more work ahead of time. Delta pi is equal to the pressure of the, sorry, the osmotic pressure of the feed minus the osmotic pressure of the permeants. And last class I showed you the vectors for those two pressures and why that equation there makes sense. So you can you can calculate pi feed minus pi permeant. Let's just do one of them. Pi feed is equal to the concentration times R times T. And I'm using lowercase c here to emphasize that that concentration is in moles of ions per meter cubed. It's not the capital C concentration kilograms of salt per meter cubed. Though it's very easy to change between the two of them. So moles of ions per meter cubed. And remember that there's two ions, there's two moles. There's Na and Cl minus released per, per mole of salt. Well, we don't have the information for moles of salt, but we do have the weight percent. So 1.8 weight percent. Um, 1.8 weight percent can be considered as 1.8 grams of NaCl, and then the remainder, if you take an, uh, 100 grams of material, there'll be 98.2 grams of water in that. Okay. So what we can do then is just a, a bit of unit conversions, convert the water mass to, um, to volume, and we convert the grams of NaCl to moles. Okay, so I'm not going to, um, to do that. That's a very straightforward calculation. Uh, simple unit conversion, and you get 
628 moles of ions per meter cubed. Okay, so go. Uh, we did this calculation in the last class, in fact, so it's not something I need to repeat here. So 628 moles of ions per meter cubed, that is equal to the concentration of the feed, capital C. We can do the same for the permeate. And again there, I'll just re report the number for you to try out, is 17.1 moles per meter cubed. Okay, so if you take the 0 0.05 weight percent, you can convert it to a molar concentration. Once you have the molar concentrations there, you can calculate pi permeate and pi feed. So put those in as well, perhaps. So pi for the permeate. Uh, what's interesting here is just to see the numeric values and how they differ. 0 0.42 atmospheres on the permeate side, so that's the reverse osmosis back into the system, and then pi feed. This is interesting number because it's, it shows just how much pressure is being created by that salt. So 15.4 atmospheres. Okay, so that's the osmotic pressure that we have to overcome, 15.4 atmospheres. Okay, and if you look back at the table from the prior class, that number is in the range of where we expect salt water osmotic pressures to be. And you should always double check that calculation to make sure it's, it's reasonable. So what I'm referring to here is back when we just introduced the topic, I showed you representative osmotic pressures. So seawater is 25.2, that's three and a half weight percent salts. So we're at uh, 1.5, uh, sorry, 1.8 weight percent salts. So we expect something lower than that. And one, 15 atmospheres is reasonable. Okay, so we have everything here. We have delta pi, delta P, we have delta pi now from pi feed minus pi permeate. We have a solvent, it's a sub in and calculate. Let's just, um, let's just quickly show some of that. Do you mind if I erase this, everyone got that down? Okay, so if we sub in over there, JV is equal to A solvent times delta P minus delta pi. 1.1 times 10 to the minus 4. Let's pay attention here to the units. Kilograms per second per meter squared atmosphere multiplied by delta P times delta pi. That's the net result of that is 50.1 atmospheres. And so we get atmospheres canceling. And I'll emphasize this as well. This is kilograms of water, right? We're dealing with the solvent. So kilograms of water, should be, we should indicate that over there. And that simplifies then to JV is 0.00. .00 551 kilograms of water per second per meter squared, which you can then convert to LMH. So LMH is liters of water. It's easy to convert kilograms of water to liter, seconds to hours, and JV then is 19.8 LMH, which is definitely within the range that we had seen there earlier on. Okay, let's, um, let's look at the salt flux through the membrane. So we looked at the, the solvent flux through the membrane. The salt flux, I derived the equation back there a minute ago.
So J salt is A salt times C on the feed side minus the concentration on the permeate side. So those concentrations are up there. Um, the only one thing I do want you to pay attention to is the units. Again, as I said, uh, get, get really messy here. A salt, 16.8 times 10 to the minus 8 meters per second. Okay. And J salt is a salt flux. What would salt fluxes units be? Suggestions? No suggestions? Kilograms of salt per meter squared seconds. Okay, so that's what we would like on the right hand side. What concentration units do we need then to make that balance? To make the units? Kilograms per meters cubed, okay? So we need units here of kilograms per meter cubed for the concentrations. And then that equation, so units are consistent. One thing that should, should jump out at you immediately is actually this set of units here, meters per second. Is that reasonable? Does that seem right? Not the number, the units themselves. No? No one remember 3M? Mass transfer coefficients. Mass transfer coefficients always have those sets of units. It always seems kind of weird why, why it looks like a velocity. But mass transfer units, when simplified, a mass transfer coefficient has these units. And if you look at this equation, it's a mass transfer equation. It's the transfer of mass from the feed side to the permeate side. How fast does that, that transfer occur? The mass transfer coefficient tells you, A salt. Okay. So pay attention to these equations as well and interpret them in the context of your prior courses. It's, that's a, a really critical piece of um, insight that you must take from this course. There's definitely an integration there between the material from the different courses. So C phi times C permeate, we need units of kilograms per meter cubed then, as, as, as was said. Well, we don't have that actually. We have moles per meter cubed. So I can do a conversion over there. Um, so I'll leave you to do that. The permeate concentrations and the feed concentrations, you can easily show to yourselves that those concentration differences are 18.3 kilograms per meter cubed for the feed side and 0 0.5 kilograms per meter cubed on the permeate side. then the units make sense and we get a salt flux of 2.85 times 10 to the minus 7 kilograms of salt per meter squared second. So it's a salt flux over there. Now again, these, whenever you start to see these very small exponents, that's really hard to work with. And for part three, I'm asking you to compare these fluxes. So perhaps um, let, me, um, let me just scale this up to units that are a little bit more familiar to you. Uh, 1.03 grams of salt. So not kilograms of salt, grams of salt per meter squared. And let's move to an hour basis. Okay, so I just wanted to get numbers that are, are numbers that we're comfortable dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. And now you can actually see how really effective this membrane is. You're only allowing one gram of salt to pass through the entire membrane surface, uh, per meter squared of membrane surface area every hour. How much liquid are you allowing to transfer through that same membrane area per hour? The answer is over here. About 20 liters of material passes through the membrane every hour. Okay, so 
it's giving you a great idea of the rejection coefficient, which is the next part you're going to calculate. How well is this membrane rejecting the salt and allowing the solvent, the water, to pass through? Well, we've got a number for that, the rejection coefficient. Um, let's just write it up over here. This equation was in an earlier slide introduced, I think, in the topic of ultrafiltration. We had this equation that the rejection coefficient is 1 minus the permeate concentration over the feed concentration. Okay. I will just quickly note here for you, um, recall that pi permeate was equal to C permeate times RT. And if I divide that by pi feed, that's equal to the feed concentration over RT. Okay, so membranes typically have the same temperature on the permeate and the feed side, so that cancels out. And so if you don't have C permeate and C feed, you can always use the osmotic pressure ratio as a surrogate there. Either, either way, we have both numbers in this, in this problem, so we could use either set. And we can use concentration units in any units we desire because, again, they cancel out. So it doesn't matter if these are moles or kilograms per meter cubed. Um, you can calculate there the rejection coefficient is 17.1 over 628. I'm using molar concentrations, but if you used mass concentrations, uh, that would work just as well. And so your rejection ability of this membrane is 97%, 97.3, really, really high rejection coefficient. Any, any uncertainties or any doubts on the work done so far in that example? Yeah. I typed it in the calculator exactly. I used 6 feet times 10 to the negative 8, and I ended up getting a solid times 10 to the negative 8. Okay. So I, it was like 10 grams instead. Okay, I could be off. Um, Should it be 16 or 1.6? It's whatever your calculator says. I may have made a mistake. I know when I did it uh, two days ago and I did it this morning, I got 10 to the 7, and then I got 10 to the minus 6. So one of them is wrong, one of them is right. So it could be a factor of 10 off there. As you see, I've said this many times, I don't pay too much attention to calculations in my courses, right? That's, computers do that effectively for us. Okay, so either interpretation, 1 or 10 grams of salt. I think it's, it's likely 10 is the correct answer. Uh, 10 grams of salt per meter squared hour. That's still very, very little when you consider it in the context of the 20 liters of water that that 10 grams of salt is dissolved in it, per hour per meter squared. Now don't be fooled by that. Think back to that picture of the desalination plant I showed you just how many meters squared there are. Okay, there's a substantial area of um, wrapped up inside those spiral wound membranes. Okay, so it's still, still a fair amount of salt going through, but it's down to 0.05 weight percent. Uh, just another comment on units, this, this whole problem hinges substantially on a correct use of your units. Uh, one thing to point out is 0 0.05 weight percent, you'll also see that written as 500 ppm, parts per million. Okay, so you can easily show the, the relationship between those two. One part per million, so it's one over a million parts, 500 parts over a million parts is the equivalent of 0 0.05 weight percent. So sometimes you'll see uh, literature referring to PPMs instead of weight percent. OK, thanks for picking up that calculation error. Yeah. Would, would that be mole percent or weight percent? It's, it's usually weight percent when it's referred to in the literature. Yeah. OK, because it's weight of salt over weight of water. Okay, so let's, um, there's one final example to work through over here, and I will actually just uh, give you the, the answers for this one.
so that you can go do the example at home. It's really, it's really not a difficult problem, but essentially this problem is one where instead of me giving you a solvent and a salt, I'm giving you the information so that you can calculate that. So the goal in this question is to actually calculate a solvent and a salt. So if you read through that problem over there, you're given the pressure information, you're given the flux information, you're given the mass of salt on the permeate side on the, and on the feed side, so you can calculate the osmotic pressures. So you've got all the information then, and, and you're actually given A, the area. Why are we given the area? Well, recall that JV is QP over A. Okay, so if you know your molar, sorry, if you know your volumetric flow rate, QP, which is given over here, so the permeate is measured at 1.92 10 to the minus 8 meters cubed per second. So that's QP. We're given A up there in the first sentence. So we know JV. We've got to calculate A solvent and we're given enough information for delta P and delta pi. So that's the plan essentially for that problem um, that you can go apply. And if you work through this one again, pay attention to the units. Um, the answers to that problem are that the solvent permeability or permeance is 2.07 times 10 to the minus 4. And as I said, the units are important kilograms of solvent per second per atmosphere per meter squared. They always have those, those units. In fact, the previous problem had those same set of units. And the previous problem had asked Let's just go back to that. The permeance of water has been established. Kilograms of solvent per second per meter squared atmosphere. How would you get this number? Well, this problem tells you the lab experiment that you would run to get that number. Okay. Calculate the permeance constants for solvent. We've done that. Calculate the permeance number for salt. Okay. Permeance for salt, same, same principle. If we rearrange our prior equation, we get A salt is equal to the salt flux over the concentration difference C feed minus C permeant. permeate. We're given C feed, we're given C permeate. We just don't know J salt, but we actually do know what J salt is from that prior equation I showed you this morning. J salt is equal to the solvent flux multiplied by Cp. Okay. I did that, that derivation for you earlier this morning. So we do know the numerator, in fact, because we know J solvent. We know Cp. We know C feed minus Cp again. Okay. So there we have the, the information. And for you to go verify that that calculation is correct at home, um, you can go do so, and you should find A salt is 3.9 times 10 to the minus 7 with units of the mass transfer coefficient, meters per second. Okay. And then the final part of the question actually also uh, asks for the rejection coefficient. Again, Please uh, try this yourself and confirm that it's 96.1%. Okay, so enough practice uh, problems over there for, for this section. We've done two today. We did a substantial number of problems last week on Tuesday and Wednesday, and then prior to that as well. So you should have good practice on the membrane. Uh, topic. So next class we'll start uh, liquid liquid f uh, extraction. Please take a look on the course website later this morning or for the notes for that topic.